of God. I tell you, there's more theology in those songs than yeah. most people think. I mean, those songs are songs that uh, we've been singing since I was a little kid, which uh, wasn't that long ago, I'll admit. <laughs> uh, it's not exactly an old hymn or anything, but I tell you what, the theology in those Amen. songs is, is something. Yes. Right. This gospel is not just some come to church to appease your conscience uh, yes. nothing to feed you, go through the motions kind of gospel. This yes. gospel is a sinner saved gospel. Yes. Yes. This gospel is a weak made strong yes. gospel. Yes. Yes. This gospel is a hide behind the rock Jesus yes. Christ yes. gospel. Yes. It is a powerful gospel. Yes. The yes. message of the cross is the power of God to yes. those who are saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a gospel. What a Savior. Hallelujah. I'm thankful this evening. I'm thankful uh, not just to have the opportunity to be up here and to, to share with you this gospel, but to be living it in my daily life. And, and when I say living the gospel, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm this, uh, you know, this uh, holy person who, who lives the Word of God. No, what I'm saying is, is that I am a sinner saved by the grace Amen. of God. Praise I need God. this Hallelujah. blood just as much as anybody else needs this blood. Amen. I'm walking in this blood. I'm learning Amen. this blood. I'm learning this gospel. And I'm learning this Savior. And you know, that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to be talking about how we learn our Savior. How we walk in this gospel. If you would, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to start in the first verse. Just read a verse or two and then, and then skip on down. Uh, while you're turning there, I just want to say again, I'm, I'm thankful to uh, Pastor Matt, even though he's not here. And uh, to the rest of you as well, to be kind enough to have me. Uh, I graduated from World Evangelism Bible College two years ago. Uh, although graduates of WEBC have a different name for WEBC, and that's Wilderness Experience Bible College. And uh, we call it that because uh, not only is there a, a focus on, on the message of the cross, and the Bible is our main textbook, but uh, in that college, uh, we're expected to uh, not only learn and to study the message of the cross, but we there learn to walk in it. As well. Amen. As you learn the message of the cross, faith comes by hearing. Amen. And as that faith rises up and as you, you learn to walk the, the gospel walk, uh, the Holy Spirit begins to transform you. And of course, the Amen. enemy starts to come against you. And uh, I got to tell you, WEBC is, uh, is boot camp. <laughs> it's the boot camp of the gospel. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for my time there. Uh, and I'm thankful that uh, the message of the cross is going out all over this world, that this church has embraced it. This Amen. gospel is not new. That's right. This gospel right. has God. been from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And um, I'm hoping more and more, and I'm believing more and more, we'll get a hold of it. Well, have you found Ephesians chapter 4? I mean, I'm not giving you a lot of time. If you haven't found it by now, just scoot close to somebody. <laughs> All right. And uh, consider WEBC. They'll help you out with that. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in the first verse. The Apostle Paul writes, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, if you would... Skip down with me to verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, 
which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, uh, we went through several verses here, and there are several verses in between where we, where we read, but what Paul is talking about here is the life of the Christian, yeah. the lifestyle of the Christian, the walk of the Christian. And there are as many answers to victorious and useful Christian living as there are preachers. There are as many opinions on how Christians are to order their daily lives and how they are to walk uh, as Christians. There are as many opinions on that as there are preachers. But God only has one way. There is only one way that Christians are to walk. There is only one way. Four times in the Word of God. Now, if the Bible says something once, it's true, and it's important. If the Bible says something twice, it's very important. If it says it three times, it's critical. And if it says it four times, well, basically, you might as well just beat you over the head with it. The just shall live by faith. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to, to you in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I ask first and foremost that you would take me out of the way tonight, Lord God. Lord, that these people would not hear my words, Lord God. Lord, I know that I am not qualified in and of myself to be up here to say anything, Lord God, that could feed your people. Lord, we ask for a sovereign move of your Holy Spirit to take your word to put it through my mouth, Lord God, into the ears of the listeners, Lord God, and to bury it into their hearts, Lord God, to bring forth fruit to you, Lord God. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And the title of this message uh, tonight, we like to give titles so we can remember back. Uh, you know, there's a word someone will preach, and you'll think, man, that statement, that title has never left me. Now, this one's not all that, uh, uh, you know, Theological or crazy. It's just a quote from, from the word that we read. You have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. So, as I mentioned, that there is a way that believers are to walk, are to order their steps. And we get from this chapter that there are two ways to walk total. One way for Christians and two ways total. There is the old way, which we walk in by default when we are, are born. That is our default state. Before we're saved, there is a way that we walk. And then after we get saved, there is a new way. There is a new conversation, a new lifestyle. So there's the old way and the new way. The Bible also calls it the old man. Got a prop here already for me there. R.I.P. Adam the old man. <laughs> That's the old way. Dead and buried for the believer, and then there is a new way. The Bible also describes the old way and the new way as walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. All right, so I like I like to draw, I like to explain and, and examine things a little bit. So I hope you'll forgive me for maybe getting a little chalk crazy here. But I'm, I'm going to highlight the two ways that it's possible to walk, and don't expect anything neat and tidy either. <laughs> All right, there's the flesh, that's the old way, that's the old man, that's the old lifestyle, the old way of walking, and then there is the spirit. This is the new man, the new conversation. And I think one of the most important things that you need to understand from Ephesians chapter 4 is in the first verse there where we started, Paul says, I beseech you. Now, who is he talking to? Who is he talking to? He is talking to the Ephesian believers. He's writing this letter to the Ephesian church. And again and again you'll see in Paul's epistles that he will straight up just call them brothers and, and say, I beseech you. In other words, he is writing to those who have already been uh, transformed, uh, transferred into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Those who are already saved. So if they're already saved and they're already in the new way, why would he have to warn them and say, uh, walk worthy? And then in verse 17, to say, don't walk as the Gentiles walk. This teaches us something very important. And that is that it is possible 
for a Christian, for a believer, to spend their Christian life walking the wrong way. Yeah. It is possible, and I won't even say it's possible, if Paul did not give this instruction to the Ephesians, it is a certainty that they would walk and continue to walk the wrong way. Because, yes, we're saved, and 100% saved. There's no caveat to that. There's no but to that. You're, when you're saved, you're saved. You will never be more saved than you were when you first came to Christ Amen. as it regards righteousness, the, the position that you have in Christ. When you're saved, you are saved. However, uh, we look at salvation as a three-part process, past, present, and future. When you first come to Christ, you are saved from the penalty of sin. You're justified. That's 100%. That's complete. And that's instant. And in the future, when Jesus Christ comes back for his church, or you die, and you go to be with Christ, you will be saved from the presence of sin. Never to be around it again. Never to have to experience fear, doubt, unbelief, uh, disappointment, death. You will be completely and totally saved. You will no longer be dying. Our bodies have not yet been redeemed. We're still flesh and blood. Yeah. So there's coming a day where that salvation will take place. So now we've seen the past salvation when we got saved, which is what we walk in here. And a, a coming salvation that we haven't seen yet. I'm still dying. I, I'm aging. I haven't you know, aged too much yet, but it'll come. Okay? And as age comes, so come the wrinkles. So come the gray hair. And I'm, I'm not making eye contact with any of you at this point. <laughs> Well, uh, it wouldn't matter. You're all young anyway. But uh, death is a part of our, our physical existence at this point. But in between the past salvation and the future salvation, there is a present ongoing salvation. This is what we refer to as sanctification. Amen. This is a lifelong process of being conformed into the image of God. When you first get saved, you're saved. But you have not been conformed into his image in your, in your walk, in your lifestyle. You don't have it all together. You're not sinlessly perfect in your walk and in your conversation and in your mind. <coughs> so that there is a process, once you are saved, of the Holy Spirit renewing your mind. Teaching you how to walk. Changing how you are minded. How your mind operates. And changing uh, your behavior. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that uh, if we could look into a glass, and, and he's referring to a mirror, we would see the perfect image of the glory of God on our faces. But we with open face, looking as if in a, in a glass, seeing the perfect image, the glory of God, are at the same time being transformed into that image. We are transferred into that same image from glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, little bit by little bit. Amen. So when, when you first get saved, again, your, your mind is not trans, transformed yet. You don't know how to walk yet. Right. And this is where Amen. I'm getting to. By default, when you first get saved, though you are completely saved and there is nothing between you and God, there is therefore now no condemnation to those Amen. who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after Amen. the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is no condemnation. You are justified. However, if you do not learn how to walk, you will walk according to what you know. Amen. You will walk according to what you know. So he is teaching us and shaping our understanding to show us how to walk. And that is for that reason, Paul, in talking to the Ephesians there in the first verse of our chapter, beseeches them. And that word beseech there in the Greek is parakolo. And uh, you might recognize that word in the description, the word that describes the Holy Spirit. He's the parakletos, the comforter, the one who comes alongside. Uh, he's our exhorter. And, and that's what Paul, and really what the Holy Spirit is doing through Paul in this chapter. He's doing the work of a paraclete to, to exhort you to something, to bring you to something, to comfort you with something, and to instruct you with something. To teach them that you walk worthy. All right, so you're saved. That's your position. But now how do you walk? And again, the Bible says four times, the just shall live, shall walk, shall order their steps by faith. But you need to know that. You need to understand that faith and how it all works. Or else you will walk 
the old way and not the new way. So let's take a look at what the old way looks like. If you uh, go right there in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. So he's saying there's a way that Gentiles walk. And when he says Gentiles, he's just referring to people who aren't saved. Those who aren't in the kingdom of God. So he's saying there's a way they walk. And what is that way? In the vanity of their mind. So I'm going to write that down under the flesh here. Okay, under the heading of the flesh, this is how you walk. The vanity of your mind. That is the method or the sphere or the environment that you are walking in when you are walking the old way. What does that word vanity mean? It simply means useless, empty, void. There's a scripture that comes to mind in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, right there in between verses 18 and, and 23, when he talks about how God brings to nothing... The wisdom of the wise and brings to nothing. He destroys the wisdom of the wise and brings to nothing the understanding of the prudent. In other words, the message of the cross bankrupts the wisdom of man entirely. When you hold up God's wisdom next to man's wisdom, man's wisdom is nothing. Amen. It's Amen. empty. Yes. It's vanity. And how we are born and how we learn according to our lives in the flesh and the sin nature, our minds operate in an empty, useless state. It doesn't matter how educated you become. It doesn't matter what you do with your life. It doesn't matter how much money you make. When it's all said and done, it is nothing. It's empty. It's void. It's useless. So how dare we as preachers and as the church preach or support anything that comes out of the mind of unredeemed men? How dare we as Christians tolerate and support anything that comes out of the mind of man rather than the mind of God? It's vanity, it's the flesh, it's the old way, and it's useless. It will produce nothing. <coughs> It will produce no fruit unto God. And the end result will be death. So let's take a, a, a further look at the description of, of being in the flesh. Because we see that they're walking in the vanity of, of their mind. But then Paul gives us some results of that. Their understanding is darkened. Alright? Darkened understanding. This, I'll try not to write too much here. <laughs> Try to summarize it as much as possible, but that is the state when you're walking in the vanity of your mind. You have a darkened understanding. What that means is, is the light of the truth, the illumination, if you will, of what is true and what is false, that light cannot reach your understanding. You will be incapable of seeing that light. There's something cloudy. <coughs> And what is clouding it? The flesh. That's good. The flesh is, is a clouder. It blocks. And, and we're, we're going to see that a little bit more uh, a little bit later. Uh, and the, the other results, I'm not going to take the time to write them all down, but you can see them right there in the Word. Not only is their understanding darkened, but they're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Ignorance meaning not knowing. All right, because of the blindness of their heart. And then we see the, it, it manifest itself in their conduct, that they become past feeling. Their conscience no longer bugs them when they do something wrong. Their conscience no longer tells them what's right and what's wrong. They don't even feel it anymore. And they just turn themselves over to lasciviousness. There's no moral compass or any self-control or anything. And they work all uncleanness and with greediness. Now, that doesn't just uh, describe the worst of the world. That describes the entire world. Yes. That describes you before you came to Christ, no matter how good yeah. 
you think you were or how not evil you think you were. In fact, the, the purer you thought you were before Christ, the more darkened your understanding really was. Yeah, that's good. Because I find that living this life in Christ as the Holy Spirit reveals the gospel to me, the more of His glory I see, Amen. the more I realize Amen. what I am in my yes, own heart. Right, yes. The darker I realize it really is. You don't understand Amen. the darkness of your heart until you begin to see the light of His glory. Amen. Amen. All right, so that's walking in the flesh. But now we see a contrast here. Paul says, but you... Stop there. You, who's that? This proves again that he's writing to Christians. You, the Ephesian believers, and you in this room, and me, have not so learned Christ. Let's look at that word, so. That word so there, uh, in the Greek, really just points us to the manner or the method in which we learned Christ. We did not learn Christ in the vanity of our mind. The mind, our own natural human understanding and our, our own natural human ways, were not sufficient to teach us Christ. That's not how we came in. We didn't figure out salvation and come to some mathematical conclusion. <laughs> Simply put, Jesus Christ died for our sins, presented us with His redemption plan, handed us a gift, and we just took it. Now, I've heard a lot of uh, Calvinists will say, you're trying to take glory for your salvation by saying you had any hand in it. They believe in the once saved, always saved. God created some people for heaven and some for hell, and that is foolishness. What credit do you get for accepting a gift? Amen. If I work and toil and labor my entire life to scrounge up enough money to come up with a great gift for you, and I put it together, and I wrap it up in a nice box, and I drive all the way to your house, and I ring the doorbell to call you to the door, and I hand it to you, are you going to go around to your friends and say, well, yeah, he did all that, but I took it. I accepted the gift. It's like, well, good job. <laughs> There's no real credit you get for accepting a gift. He did all the work. But it wasn't the vanity of your mind that brought your salvation. And therefore, it is not the vanity of your mind that's going to help you walk in that salvation. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh, Paul would ask? Hmm. He said, foolish Galatians. No, if you begin in the Spirit, you continue in the Spirit. Amen. You walk how you came in. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in Him. So now we're talking about how we are to walk. And now understand this again, that you as a believer have a propensity in yourself, in your mind, to walk that way. The old way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. There's something in you that wants to go that way. Amen. Even yes. as a Christian. Even yes. as a believer. All right. So now, in the spirit, now, because we're talking, looking at that word so, and the, the method in which that we learn Christ is the same way we came in, which was through the Holy Spirit, okay? So now, in the Holy Spirit, we learn Christ. And if you read down a little bit, it says that we are to be uh, renewed in the spirit of our mind. And we put on the new man. So now we see a contrast between the vanity of our mind and we see renewed in the mind. This is completely opposite of the flesh. The vanity of your own mind, this is not something that your mind does. This is something that the spirit does in your mind. You see the contrast? And... In that renewing of our mind, the light of the gospel is able to shine through, right? So you have a darkened understanding, and I'll just say, uh, now I don't really um, like using the word enlightenment too much because of certain false religions that have hijacked it. Right. Um, but we have an enlightened understanding, and that's true. The light of the gospel, the light of God's glory is able to be brought to us now. How that uh, enlightenment happens, again, is not through the vanity of our minds. Our minds cannot uh, bring that light in, is all I'm trying to say. That has to be something that the Holy Spirit does in us through changing us. Okay? And let's go ahead and go over to Romans chapter 8. 
uh, so that we can understand a little bit more about the old way and the new way and uh, tell you how to do each one. I'm, I, I'm sure you already know how to do the old one, but... <laughs> Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start in the second verse, but before we begin there, I want to make sure that we're on this page, that we understand some important things about Ephesians chapter 4. One, do you understand that there's two ways that you can walk? There are two ways, the flesh and the spirit, the old way and the new way. And understand that Paul is beseeching Christians to walk the new way, not the old way. Which shows us that we need to be beseeched. We need to be taught this. We need to be exhorted to this, and not just once, but continuously. Why? Because if we're left to our own understanding, even as Christians, that's how we're going to walk yes. the old way. So now let's take a look a little bit deeper on what the old way and the new way and see how it comes about. Um, I'll actually start in verse 1 because it's just too good to leave out. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they who are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they who are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can it be. So that they are, that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, I want to stop there because, I mean, we could just blow right through that chapter and it's saying everything that I'm trying to say to you tonight. But uh, let's examine one little thing about the flesh here as it regards the law. In verse 3, it says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, how many of you know that the law of God is a good thing? Yeah. Amen. 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 It's good. The, the law, the Paul said, I consent unto the law that it is good. Uh, although the context he was referring to it was a little bit different in that chapter. But the law of God is not evil. Amen. The law of God is not uh, God doing something mean or evil to us. The, the law is a good thing. And in fact, unless <coughs> your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees who claim to follow the law, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Unless your level of righteousness before God is above the standard of God's law, you won't make it into heaven. You have to be perfect. You have to match up to His standard to get into heaven. And without the gospel, that's bad news. Because none of us can do that. That's right. None of us can do that. Why? Because this is how we're born. This is how we walk by default without the gospel. And verse 4 there in Romans chapter 8 says that the law is weak through the flesh. The flesh blocks righteousness. Why are all these words so big? <laughs> Long words. All right. Blocks righteousness. The, the, the word through there is the Greek preposition dia. And that preposition refers to a channel or instrument through which something travels. Uh, the law, you have to have the righteousness of the law. You have to fulfill it. The righteousness of the law has to come through you to God, as a matter of speaking. If you understand that preposition, it's, it's through that means. However, when the law tries to send its righteousness through the flesh, it's weak. And the word weak there means it's, it, it's impossible. It's what it can't do. It's... It's uh, futile. The law simply cannot pass its righteousness through flesh. The flesh is like a dirty straw. If you try to pass that perfectly clean water through that straw that's full of mud, is any clean water going to come out the other side? 
It's how the righteousness of, of God works and how the law works. However, in order for God to accept us to himself, to be united with us, that righteousness had to take place. That righteousness had to go through a straw, so to speak, other than our flesh. Right. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Weak through the flesh. Here's the answer. God sending his own son Amen. in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So he had his own straw, his own flesh, if you will. He had his own flesh, his own straw. But the difference between his straw and my straw, the difference between his flesh and my flesh is that mine is sinful and full of mud and his is clean. Amen. Amen. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh in that he had a straw, he had a flesh, but he was without sin. Yes. He performed perfectly the perfect standard of God's righteousness for us. That righteousness of God passed straight through him and went in clean and came out clean. Yes. Because in him yes. was no yes. sin. Thank yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. And in that flesh, that flesh of Christ, that clean straw, if you will, was nailed to a tree 2,000 years ago so that it could become our straw. I, I keep saying the word straw and it seems silly in this conversation, but, but do you understand where I'm going with that? I get to use his straw instead of mine. Mm -hmm. I get Amen. to use the clean one. Yes, I don't have to rely on the muddy one for the righteousness of God. Amen. Through his flesh, the righteousness passed through clean. In order that, so that, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in him, in us. The righteousness is fulfilled in us. The flesh is taken out of the way through what Christ did on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Through his flesh, mine is thrown out the window. Amen. Through his flesh dying on Calvary and being buried under the earth, my flesh is buried with him. <coughs> so when God looks at me, he doesn't see that dirty straw where the righteousness can't come through. He sees the perfect righteousness of his son Amen. when he sees me. Amen. That is what he has made available to me. That is my, that is the new creation. He's given me a new straw, a clean one that's righteous. Amen. Hallelujah. He's given me a new man that it can be renewed in the spirit of my mind that has an enlightened understanding. That is what he has for me. So now I must walk according to that. Right. Yes. Amen. That's how I walk. Again, as a Christian, I have the option to go back and start living that way. Uh, I can't get away from this illustration. I mean, now that I'm here, uh, sorry to steal it, but Lauren Larson uses this uh, pretty often, and he said that <laughs> you don't uh, dig up your dead cat foo-foo from the backyard and start playing with it again. <laughs> That's silly. Amen. Right? Amen. That's inappropriate. <laughs> Yes. And, and that's just not how it works. So why would we want, or, or I'll say it this way, we should not go and dig up that flesh that he Amen. crucified Amen. at the cross and start walking that way. That's right. But the knuckleheads that we are who haven't been transformed in our minds who don't know how to walk yet, that's just what we go and do. Right. And that's how we walk. And we keep walking that way until someone like the Apostle Paul shows up and says, what are you doing? Yes. You have a new calling. Amen. You have a new man. Yeah. And you can put him on and walk in it. So do it. Yeah. Put off the old man. Put on the new. It's like taking off one shirt and putting on another one. Oh, and that new one is by faith. Amen. All right? So if you look at this now, though, it says that if you walk after the flesh... And, and let's examine walk a little bit here. It's a Greek word, peripateo, and it refers to how you conduct yourself. Well, you're the environment that you're walking around in. Are you walking in the uh, truth of the gospel, or are you walking the old way? Are you walking according to the new rule, which is that in Christ, uncircumcision and circumcision, they profit nothing, the uh, fleshly obedience to uh, the law of God, which we just saw was impossible, will afford you nothing. The new rule, which is the just shall live by faith. Are you walking that way, 
Or are you relying on the very flesh he died to crucify? And then it says that those who are doing that, who are trusting in something other than the cross, who are trusting something other than the death of Christ, they are after the flesh. It says they do mind the things of the flesh. And, and this is a point that I think is very important to bring out, is that very often, and the vast majority of the modern church has confused the root with the fruit. Well, it wasn't supposed to rhyme, but it did. <laughs> Maybe that'll help us remember it. Yeah. They confuse the root with the fruit. They confuse the work with the results. They, they confuse the, the walking with the fruit of where you're walking. And what I mean is this, is that if you are after the flesh, you will mind the things of the flesh, and the fruit of the flesh is going to come out. Amen. That's right. All right? The fruit of the flesh. Now, what's the fruit of the flesh? That's the evil. That's the envying. That's the anger. That's the fornication. That's whatever it is. Right. But sometimes, you know, the, well, sometimes, most of the time, the modern church looks at those sinful actions and considers that walking after the flesh. Right. No, those that's things are a symptom that's right. of walking after the flesh. Right. Those are the yeah. fruit of the flesh. That is the result of walking the old way. That's good. So... When we see things like, you know, if you walk after the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> what do you do with that? If walking after the Spirit just means doing good things and not doing bad things, then that wouldn't make any sense. You'd be saying, in, in effect, you'd be saying that if you stop doing bad things, you'll stop doing bad things. <laughs> if you don't walk after the flesh, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> They, they would be confused on that because they don't understand the difference between walking after the flesh and the fruit of the flesh. The mistake, the error happens before any of those things come to the surface. Before you find yourself walking in bondage, the issue happened. That's right. So if you find yourself walking contrary to the will of God and you see the fruit of the flesh manifesting, that's a sign to show you that you are not walking after the Spirit. If there's fruit, there's got to be some kind of root. Amen. Right? If you okay. sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. Yes. So if you are reaping of the flesh corruption, you've got to think, well, I think I was sowing to my flesh. Yes. That's, the, that's what that's supposed to show us. However, if we sow to the Spirit, all right, now we're talking about Galatians chapter 6, and I don't want to jump around too much on here, but if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap of the Spirit. So if those who are after the flesh, right there in verse 5, do mind the things of the flesh, but they who are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death. So we see earlier in, in Ephesians chapter 4, we see how they are past feeling. They have turned themselves over into lasciviousness. They are walking contrary. They're alienated from the life of God. They're walking in death. And the reason that is, is because they are walking after the flesh, the old way. Okay, now I'm going to bring this into a little bit more of a, of a simple conclusion in just a little bit. But uh, understand that there are two ways to walk. And there is a result that will happen with each way. If you walk after the flesh, the result will be the fruit of the flesh. If you walk after the Spirit, the result will be the fruit of the Spirit. So now, as a Christian, obviously, you, you, the Holy Spirit is working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You want uh, to please God. You want to walk uh, according to how He wants you to walk. And if you want that kind of a walk, if you want that kind of righteous behavior manifesting itself then stop trying to do it on your own. Amen. Amen. You can't do it through the flesh. Amen. It doesn't matter how hard you try. If you're putting the wrong seeds in the ground, you're going to get the wrong plants. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I'm trying to line them up a little bit better. You know, uh, the righteous seeds are lined up this way. Maybe if I take my flesh seeds and line them up a certain way, or maybe if I just don't sow as many fleshly seeds. No, you put flesh seeds in the ground, they're going to come up. Yes. As the fruit of the flesh. You put spirit seeds in the ground, they're going to come up as the spirit. So now here's the question and here's the confusion that most people are confused on is how? 
We know as Christians, it's not this big revelation that we have to have the fruit of the Spirit. It's no big mystery that the fruit of the flesh is a bad thing for Christians. That's not a mystery. But what appears to be a mystery in the church is how. How do I stop walking this way and, and walk that way? How do I stop walking in the old man and start walking in the new? Well, Romans chapter 8 just laid it out for us. The law could not pass its righteousness through the flesh. So the flesh has got to go. But how did he get rid of the flesh? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, how God dealt with the old man, that stuff was through the cross. Amen. Amen. That is how God was put to death. And that is how the spirit took over. And that was God's way of dealing with the flesh. And it wasn't just his way momentarily on the cross. That has been his way from the beginning of the universe. Christ slain from the foundation of the world. It has always been the plan of God <clears throat> to use the sacrifice to deal with that. And it has always been and that will never change. For you as a believer, how God deals with that and brings you to that, from the old to the new, how he does that is through the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. And yeah. for that reason, we read in uh, Revelation, uh, I want to say chapter 5, but I feel like I might be wrong on that. 5 or 15, there's a 5. <laughs> <laughs> that the scene in heaven changed when the Lamb showed up. When the Lamb showed up, all the elders around the throne, all the angels, the myriads and myriads of angels, and the saints turned towards the Lamb and said, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor and power and dominion and strength forever and ever. And it says that their song continued forever. Meaning from eternity past to eternity future. Our praise our song, God's way, God's wisdom is the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That is what yes. bought us. That is what brought us in. That is what saved us. Now walk in it. You were brought in by the cross. Now walk in the cross. Walk in the cross. And by walking in the cross, we go back to that rule, the just shall live by faith. Amen. By faith, you place your faith in the sacrifice of Christ, which is who, what, uh, who Jesus is and what he did at Calvary's cross. And when you place your faith there, the result, the fruit, is that. The new way. He will renew you in your mind. He will enlighten your understanding. And then you will be able to do everything else that he explains there in Ephesians chapter 4. You'll be able to walk in unity with your brothers and sisters. You will be able to put away wrath, lying. You'll be able to speak the truth. The, the moral standards of the gospel of Christian living will surface. Amen. Because if you put those seeds in the ground, faith in the cross, undeniably, the fruit will be the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. You don't put potato, I don't want to call them seeds, they're not really mm -hmm. seeds, but in a way they kind of are. <laughs> you take the, the piece of the tomato there, the root or potato, you put it in the ground, you're going to get potatoes. Amen. Man, how that apple tree showed up? I put potatoes in there. That's right. You know, the type of plant that's going to come up is the type of seed that you put in the ground. Yes. If the type of seed that you are sowing in your daily walk is faith in Jesus Christ and Him Amen. crucified, which is how the Spirit works, which is how the Spirit took care of the flesh, then the result the fruit will be the fruit of the Spirit. In Romans chapter 6, we see that if we have been uh, buried with Him in the likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. If we have been planted, the Greek uses a perfect tense, which means if we were in the past planted in the likeness of His death, that's the cross, that's what Jesus Christ did on, on the cross, and we remain planted there, the result is, is that we will grow yes. like a plant. We will grow in the likeness <clears throat> of His resurrection. The resurrection is the guaranteed result of an accepted sacrifice. So if you want to walk 
in resurrection power, if you want to bear the fruit of the Spirit, if you want to get over sinful bondages, if you want to be uh, have a lifestyle that's not just uh, pleasing to God in your lifestyle, but that's practical, that's useful, that is salt for the earth, that is light for the world. If you are to be an effectual, practical Christian, then your practice must be to believe, Amen. to keep your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that will bear the result. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and I'm going to be closing here right away. I don't want to keep you long. But this is kind of where it all comes together. We see that there's two ways to walk. One is through faith in the cross. One is through faith in anything else, the flesh. One has the result of life and peace, and one has the result of death. But I want to focus there on verse 20 in Ephesians chapter 4 as I come to a conclusion here. It says, but you have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. Now, it's interesting, he didn't say, you have not so learned about Christ. No. He didn't say, you have not so learned of Christ. He said, you have not so learned Christ. In changing from flesh to spirit, and in walking in the spirit, you and I learn Jesus Christ. That's and we don't just learn about him intellectually. We don't just learn from him. We learn him Amen. directly. Amen. He is his message. Yes. His message is himself. Amen. 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 Which brings us to an important truth. There are many different Jesuses out there. That's right. That's right. Peter called it another Jesus. That's right. There's a Mormon Jesus. There's a Catholic Jesus. There's a seeker sensitive Jesus. There's, again, every opinion. There's as many opinions as there are preachers, and there's as many Jesuses as there are preachers. But there is only one true Jesus. Amen. There is only one right. Savior Amen. to learn. Hallelujah. Only one that comes about that way. Only one Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this word tells us who that Jesus really is. And that Jesus cannot be separated from his work on Calvary's cross. That's right. Amen. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's who Jesus is. Yeah. So, so we don't just learn the gospel. We don't just Hallelujah. learn about the cross. In keeping our faith in the cross... In learning this gospel, we are learning Christ directly. The cross is who Jesus is. That's right. Amen. For he Amen. is Amen. our propitiation. Amen. For he is Amen. our sacrifice. <laughs> he is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. His Amen. very name means redemption. Amen. Amen. In the Hebrew, we have Jehovah or Yahweh, or however it was pronounced. No one knows because the Jews were so holy, they decided not to ever say it out loud. So the world forgot how to say his name. It's Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, but then you take Yesh uh, Yahweh and you add the word Yesha to it. Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Yahweh and Yesha, you put it together and the word is Yeshua. And that word, Yeshua, means the covenant God saves. The one who promised us that he'd save us Amen. comes through on that promise Amen. and saves Amen. us. Amen. That's the name of Jesus. That's what it means. So, and, it, and then of course it goes into the Greek, Jesus, because there's no SH sound and a bunch of other language rules. And Jesus into the Latin became Jesus. And Jesus went into the English as Jesus. But it doesn't matter what language you say his Amen. name in. It, you know, I'm not here to say, oh, we're, we're going to say Yeshua. No, if you're English, you say his name in English. It's Jesus. If you're Spanish, you say Jesus. If you're Hebrew, go ahead and say Yeshua. But his name means redemption. It means the one who promised us that he would save us made good on that promise. Amen. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people Hallelujah. from their sins. That is, how, that is what Hallelujah. we learn, and that is who we learn. We learn Christ the anointed one sent to save us from our sins. Yeah. And finally, to connect Christ in the cross, we look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, says that he became obedient. Mm -hmm. He became obedient. He humbled himself and became mm -hmm. obedient unto death, even unto the death 
of the cross. And uh, stop there for a second. I'm sorry, go back. When you say unto even, uh, the, the Greek there, those words work together. In other words, it shows direction. He was obedient unto death, and that death the whole time was the death of the cross. In other words, his entire direction in being found in fashion as a man, humbling himself, was all for the cross. Everything Jesus Christ did was for the cross. Everything in his life was for the cross. And then go on to the next verse. Wherefore, in the Greek word there, uh, for that literally means by this thing, through this thing, through him being obedient unto the death of the cross, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That's who Jesus is. Yeah. Yeah. And we learn Christ as believers. We learned him when we first got saved and we continue learning him. How? Through walking in that faith. Amen. The faith. The just shall live by faith. We walk in that faith. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I. But this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So to conclude everything that I've tried to say, I feel like I've faltered through it and everything, but there's two ways that you can walk. And day by day, your daily conversation, that's what walking means. You're either going to walk in the flesh or you're going to walk in the spirit. You can have that because it was paid for you at the cross. Amen. You can walk in that every day. You can stay in that. You can walk in that. And when you fall down, when you come across a struggle, don't try to figure it out and overcome it in your flesh. Amen. Because that's what that is. Yeah. And the result of that will be death. And you're just going to spiral downward. Amen. It's going to get worse and right. worse. Yes. But if you will give up your problem to the sacrifice, if you will take it to the foot of the cross and say, I believe that Jesus Christ died for this issue, for this situation, you cling to his grace, which comes to you through that faith of the cross, then victory is coming. Yeah. <coughs> victory is coming. The renewal of your mind is coming. The enlightenment of your understanding is coming. And the walk is coming. Stand with me, please. Yeah. Yes. God made us a promise in Romans chapter 6. He says, if we have been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be. Not we might be. Not we could be. But we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. It is a promise to you that his grace will do what it was designed to do. And that grace was not just designed to cover your sin or, or to hide it and leave you alone. That grace was designed to rid you of that issue. That grace was designed to deliver you. That grace was designed to make you into the image of Christ. And that is a guarantee. And it is a promise as long as you walk that way. Walk after the Spirit by faith in Christ. Who He is and what He did at the cross. You place the, your faith there. And you will walk that way. And the fruit will be that way. And you will not fulfill Amen. the lust of the flesh. Amen.